Um, good afternoon, everybody. So it is a pleasure for me to introduce today's uh, distinguished speaker for the College of Engineering, uh, Professor Christian Rajeshwar. Rajeshwar, I'm not sure, German or English pronunciation. Um, so I have to give some background, and I had my cheat list. Uh, I mean, his, his CV is about 70 pages long, so I didn't memorize it. Uh, so he, he got his education in India, uh, his uh, master's, I think he got it from India Institute of Technology and IIT, if you know that people who are from India, that's the best college, the best engineering colleges, system of colleges in India. And his uh, PhD he got from Indian Institute of Science. And I checked for 2012 and 2013, British ranked it as a number one school in India. So it's, if the, the snobbish British ranking actually recognized, that must be something good. Uh, that's after I left there. <laughs> well, yeah. and after they left there. Yeah, yeah. The independence. <laughs> so uh, from there he threw no he, he made his way through Nova Scotia and then he did the postdoc. So his PhD is in chemistry, his postdoc is in electrical engineering in Colorado State, which made it a perfect combination to do energy engineering. And after Colorado State he assumed uh, a position in uh, University of Texas at Darlington, where he went for assistant, associate, full professor, distinguished professor, uh, then vice, 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 uh, vice dean for the College of Science, and now he's a vice president uh, for research in the, on campus. Meanwhile, he's also the founder of the Center for Sustainable Energy of Darlington in 2004, from what I remember. Um, he has, I mean, also, I have to go to the last page to see the page of the awards. He has, like, a lot of listed. Uh, some of them is a, a fellow of the Electrochemical Society, and another one, uh, I think he got the Electrochemical Society Award for Energy Development Research. So this is very, very brief introduction of his long CV, and without any further ado, Raj, so the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, Always nice to get the applause up front. <laughs> What's going to happen later on? Um, thank you, Val, for a very kind introduction. I had a great day here. Wonderful evening last night. You gave me a tour of Mission Inn. It's just awesome in terms of the history, which is there. Had a great time on campus meeting. Very collegial set up faculty and students. It seems like a very nice atmosphere. So once again, thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak. And uh, so I'll just try and sort of put what I do in the context of bigger picture of uh, solar energy conversion, uh, both for uh, conversion to fuels as well as for environmental remediation. And I'll try to point out some common links between the two areas. And I'll just only show a couple of examples drawn from our own research. So it's a little bit of background, as Val pointed out. I'm from, I'm come from India. Uh, India is shaped almost exactly the same, same shape as Texas, and it turns out that's, I don't know why that is so. Uh, so this, this is taken out of, I know some of you may remember the show, Have Gun Will Travel, instead Have Chemistry Will Travel, so chemistry has taken me to a lot of places, and then of course I post off in electrical engineering in Colorado State, and uh, people ask me when I show this slide, this is where I come from. My, the city is uh, called Trivandrum. It's about a stone's throw from Sri Lanka across the ocean. When I show this picture, they ask me, why, why did I leave? So it's <laughs> statue to opportunity to do research. It's the main reason I came to North America. So again, the, in terms of the current group from Argentina, Thailand, India, Hungary, um, Iran, uh, Egypt, West Indies, India, so veritable United Nations, if you will, and this is one of the great things in science and research in general, right, you get the opportunity to learn from so many different cultures, and that's, a, that's been a, a huge force to be as well as I'm concerned. So, again, to put uh, in context what I do, I look at uh, photoelectrochemical cells, and this is Electrochemistry associated with uh, semiconductor electrolyte junctions, and specifically what happens when you shine light on these junctions. 
here I show three different types of approaches. Uh, historically, it's the oldest approach is shown here. Uh, so this is a semiconductor electrode. If you all recall, semiconductors have a conduction band, uh, a film valence band. When you hit it with light of the correct energy, you, you excite electron hole pairs. And because of this built-in field, this turns out to be a crucial aspect of this junction. Because of this built-in field, it tends to separate the electron hole pairs. The holes are driven to the interface. The electrons go to the back contact. So the energetics are right. Again, a lot of conditions have to be satisfied. These holes will oxidize water to oxygen, and then these protons can be uh, taken off with a counter electrode to reduce protons to hydrogen. So essentially, you are splitting in response to photo excitation. You're splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen. This is, in all, in, come to think of it, almost the perfect energy solution because. Unlike in solid state PV devices, you can store the incident light in the form of a fuel or an energy carrier such as hydrogen. And, and so there's a net chemical change happening in the electrolyte. Unlike in this case, here we use a reversible redox couple, let's say iron 2 plus 3 plus. So here there's no net chemistry happening in the electrolyte phase. What is oxidized at the one electrode, the photoanode, is re-reduced re back. So here the net result is the flow of a photocurrent in response to light. And you can make the argument there's no real advantage in using this device as opposed to a solid state PV junction. On the other side, you don't want to have an electrolyte sitting on your rooftop. So this, really, this approach has really no uh, practical application relative to solid state devices. So all the attention in recent years has focused on this approach of trying to store the incident sunlight in the form of an energy carrier or hydrogen. The third class of devices in this uh, category is also built from a semiconductor electrolyte junction, but unlike in these cases, the light is not absorbed by the semiconductor here. The light is absorbed by a photoactive dye, which serves the function of photo excitation. The dye injects an electron into the semiconductor. So the semiconductor just serves the function of acting as an electron sink, if you will. And then the, the same thing happens as here. You, you get an electric current in response to a photo excitation. This is being called a dye-sensitized solar cell. Uh, the main advantage here relative to solid state junctions is the fact that these are much more cost effective than using an expensive semiconductor like in a solid state device. Incidentally, stop me if you have any questions, guys. I don't mind interrupting at all. Just go ahead and stop me, please. Uh, so these are the three type of uh, devices, and I, I'll mainly focus on this type. You can see the analogy with what plants do in, in the photosynthesis process. Namely, this, this half reaction, the oxidation of water, is exactly the same as what happens in a plant photosynthesis system. Except that in the other side, the carbon is fixed as, as carbohydrates, unlike in this case where we're using the electrons to do the function of reducing protons to hydrogen. So the, some of the reactions that uh, we are uh, interested in, one is water splitting. Uh, the other is very related to water splitting, but instead of trying to split water, we are splitting CO2. The advantage here is you're converting a greenhouse gas to a value-added fuel. So if I can convert CO2 to, let's say, methanol, that's a value-added conversion. Not only am I taking care of an environmental problem, but I'm generating a liquid fuel at the same time. The challenges are huge, as you can imagine, because CO2 is a very happy molecule. It doesn't want to do anything. It's kinetically very inert. So you have to work really hard to make it react. And I'll, I'll point out some of the challenges a little later on. This is another reaction which is uh, 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 important from a fuel cell aspect. That is oxygen reduction. And of course, enzymes do it this in a beautiful way by very intricate self-assembled architectures the main challenge here is that we need to be able to use, uh, not use expensive metals such as platinum to do this. Uh, this has been a huge technological roadblock in, in, in the implementation of fuel cells because 
one of the problems with practical application of fuel cells has been the need for using expensive metals such as platinum. And all these, all these are inner sphere electron transfer processes with considerable kinetic barriers I mentioned in relation to CO2. So this is where design of catalysts comes in. We have to work really hard to get around these barriers and make the process go with good efficiencies. Notice that this reaction is just the opposite of what happens in the water splitting uh, reaction. So this has been one of the problems that the communities haven't really talked in terms of uh, the common issues because the, the fuel cell community, community works in isolation from the water splitting community. I think these two communities need to talk much more uh, as, so that progress can be made. This is just an observation. So let me uh, just, so the first three aspects are kind of general, uh, general uh, concepts related to what I do and then I'll mention, I close with two examples taken from our recent work. I didn't want to get into too much detail of our own uh, work without putting it in a uh, general context. Again, because of time constraints, I won't be able to go into too much detail, but I, I'll be happy to discuss the aspects in, in more detail, maybe one-on-one, -on -one or ask, ask me questions if you have any. So first of all, a lot of these concepts are not new. Again, there's a tendency to say that what we're doing is brand new. Uh, it's, that's certainly not the case. If you look at solid state PV cells, they've been around for a very long time. The notion that we get photo effects in a semiconductor electrolyte junction dates back to 1800s. Uh, even some of the newer concepts are not really new in that sense. So again, this is just an observation again that a lot of these things have been around. All we are doing is trying to improve efficiencies and to understand the mechanistic aspects in more detail. Even disensitized solar cells, they really began in serious uh, earnest effort worldwide in 1990, but if you look at the science of disensitization, that dates up much further back to the 1960s or so. So uh, let's look at the historical evolution of photoelectrochemistry and solar water splitting. We can divide roughly into four uh, areas, and this is taken from a, a guest commentary I did not too long back. This is where, I, in fact, I it got into got to see a Val's article in the same journal on bio-inspired assemblies, and that that got me thinking again about synergies between what's happening in the bio world and what what we are doing, trying to do in the water splitting area. So again, uh, a lot of the aspects with semiconductor electrolyte junctions dates back to the early days of photography. People were trying to understand uh, the behavior of semiconductors and electrolytes in, in response to light from the application of analog photography. And, and then another area was use in transistors. Before solid state transistors came into being, people were trying to construct transistors built from semiconductor electrolyte junctions. But again, they have, as you can imagine, there are practical difficulties as opposed to miniaturizing a solid state device. It's much easier to do that relative to a liquid junction. So interest in that area pretty much fell away till uh, the work of Fujima and Honda, who showed in 1970s, early 1970s, that you could use titanium dioxide to split water into hydrogen oxygen. This opened up a huge opportunity in the energy area, and so a lot of the interest in semiconductor electrolyte uh, uh, interfaces and junctions was uh, rekindled again in, in the 1970s. And that has continued, that trend has continued. In fact, if you do a literature search, you can see that the growth is roughly exponential. It's not quite exponential. I want you to keep this correlation coefficient in mind. I'll show you another trend curve where you can see the contrast. Uh, you can see some anomalies here. This is because of the fluctuation in the price of oil per barrel. So just around the time uh, of the, uh, when Reagan came into power, the price of oil, if you recall, fell to less than $10 a barrel. A lot of the interest in energy R&D fell off, drove many people away from the field. And in fact, this area did not grow again till the advent of the disensitized solar cell around 1990. 
So that accounts for some of the deviations from a strict exponential growth in the field. Very related to the use of semiconductors for energy conversion is this notion that we can use semiconductor uh, fluid interfaces for environmental remediation. This happens because, remember the holes that you generated by photo excitation, those holes in a material such as titanium dioxide can be used to generate radicals, which are highly potent. They can break down uh, many types of environmental pollutants, such as organic compounds. So when organic compounds encounter hydroxyl radicals, they break down into harmless products. So this has been another huge growth area, use of materials such as titanium dioxide for environmental remediation. And the nice thing is you can use these to, for a whole host of environmental pollutants, including metals, because the electrons now can be used to reduce toxic metals and thereby uh, remove them from the waste stream. So if you have a water stream containing mercury ions or lead ions, under favorable <coughs> circumstances, these photo-generated electrons can reduce these met metal ions to, to the elemental state, and thereby you can remove them from the water stream. So if for a waste stream containing both metal impurities as well as organic compounds such as phenols or dyes, there's really no other method available for environmental remediation other than photocatalysis. So this area has been known as heterogeneous photocatalysis. Heterogeneous for obvious reasons because we're using a solid uh, electrolyte junction as opposed to homogeneous catalysis where everything is in one phase. And, and so you can, you can even treat biological impurities such as in this example shown here for E. coli because the hydroxyl radicals will inactivate these microorganisms so that you can, you can use them to treat. And this has been now, this is the area which has actually reached commercial realization. This has been used in hospitals and things like that. You can, you can envision scenarios where you can coat, for example, a hospital surface with a thin layer of titanium dioxide. And you can use the ambient light to excite the titanium dioxide and thereby remove all uh, microorganisms from infecting surfaces. So this is a, this is a, been a huge growth area of this field. Now you look at the literature here at this field, look at how much smoother it is in terms of the exponential growth. You can see that in the, in the difference between the correlation coefficient, much higher here as opposed to the previous case. This is because this field was not affected by the price of energy. Unlike in the previous field, uh, case where uh, you had to compete with other alternative technologies, namely gasoline, which is always available. Here, there is no other competing game in town. This is the only thing. So this area has grown steadily, exponentially. In fact, you may want to check this author out. He claims that all technological processor, processes are exponential in nature. That's an interesting observation. He also has this famous for some other uh, uh, codes in terms of man and machines will ultimately coincide. I shouldn't say man, I should say human things that machines is politically correct. <laughs> but uh, he's an interesting character in terms of uh, so these uh, concepts. So here is again the contrast. You can see the deviations as opposed to this case. So let's talk about materials since we are in a materials uh, department, engineering department. Let's talk about photocatalyst materials. Now, I'm using photocatalyst in a very loose sense. I'm using it in the sense both for driving reactions with a thermodynamically uphill, like the water splitting, it's not a downhill process. So to use photocatalysis there is it's kind of loose terminology because it's not catalytic in that sense. On the other hand, oxidizing an organic pollutant is, is a truly catalytic process because in the dark, the process has very sluggish kinetics. So the light is only doing the job of speeding up the process. So it's, it's, a, it's a truly a catalytic process. On the other hand, splitting CO2 or splitting water is driving the reaction uphill in a thermodynamic sense. But still I'm using the same terminology, photocatalyst material, uh, to, for both cases. Uh, in terms of materials, you can categorize them into three boxes, if you will. 
you can recognize the first so-called first generation materials. This is kind of analogous to communications where one talks about 1G, 2G, and 3G technologies. Now we are in maybe 4G, iPhone 4, maybe the fourth generation technology. Long-term revolution. But I think we are in the fourth generation in telecom, maybe. Or, uh, but here, this is a terminology which Martin Green used for uh, essentially for solid state PV materials, but it applies to even to photocatalysts. So, so the first generation materials uh, were all single crystals. And you can imagine that these are good for gaining fundamental information, fundamental knowledge about the science, the physics, and, and the chemistry going on in the interfaces. But from a practical perspective, you have several issues in use of single crystals for large area deployment. Because remember, any time we are talking about a solar device, we are, we are faced with the, the notion of having to use large areas because of the diluteness of the energy. So, so single crystals gave us a wealth of information on the fundamental behavior of semiconductor liquid junctions in the dark and under the ra radiation. But from a practical perspective, something, some other type of material had to be used. So that led the way toward the use of polycrystalline materials, such as thin films, uh, even nanocrystalline materials. So now we are seeing the effect of nanotechnology, that nano revolution in the third, the third generation uh, materials includes things like quantum dots, because when you shrink down the size of the semiconductor to nanometer dimensions, you see drastic differences in the optical and the optoelectronic behavior of these materials compared to the bulk counterparts. So uh, quantum dot-based devices have been huge. And what's the significance of this? Because classical semiconductor uh, or PV junctions have an efficiency threshold of only about 30 odd percent. This is uh, from the theory which was uh, uh, set forth by Shockley and Quasar. So this is because of the quantum nature of the transitions that we can only get at the very maximum 30 percent efficiency. But at the laboratory scale you get much, much less. But on the other hand, if you look at 2G and 3G devices, you are, you're looking at this trajectory. You, you, are, you have the potential of realizing much higher efficiencies in the neighborhood of 50, 60 percent. Compare this to a thermal engine, which we are looking at efficiencies of much higher than 30 percent, right? You're limited there by the Carnot efficiency limit. Uh, but that's much less, much higher than the 30 percent limit that you have with the first generation device. So there's been a lot of attention shifting toward this Type, these type of materials as opposed to the classical 1G uh, type of uh, devices. Uh, so the ideal photocatalyst has to set, so this, is, this sort of summarizes some of the challenges associated with this field, that we have to satisfy multiple requirements at the same time. Many semiconductors in contact with liquids simply are not chemically stable. If you, if you take a sliver of silicon and, and dip it in water and shine light on it, the, the cell dies very quickly because you form a uh, coating of silicon dioxide on the surface. Silicon dioxide in ins is an insulator and you don't have passage of current anymore. So that's a challenge. And this is why titanium dioxide has been hugely successful because it's very stable, it's rock stable. You can throw it in strong acids, the strong alkali, alkaline media, and the material undergoes no chemical change whatsoever. It's completely stable. On the other hand, titanium dioxide has a problem with its high band gap. Its band gap is about three <coughs> electron volt. So it only responds to light in the ultraviolet. And if you look at the solar spectrum, the ultraviolet component only constitutes about 5% or so. so you need to be able to match, remember the 30% limit comes from this quantum nature of the transition that you need to match the, the spectral output of the sunlight with the semiconductor band gap. And that peak turns out to be about 1.4 electron volt. So cadmium telluride has the optimal band gap for solar conversion. On the other hand, 
cadmium tellurite has a problem with the toxicity of the elements because especially after when you talk about after use of a solar cell when you have to dispose of these materials you have to you have to think about uh, the toxicity in landfill and so forth of course the, in the lead acid battery we have done that very well thanks to very efficient recycling silicon which is a prototype semiconductor has a band gap of about 1.1 electron volt which is shifted to the higher wave the infrared range uh, higher energies uh, uh, relative to 1.4 electron volt higher wavelengths sorry lower energies so uh, all these sort of contrasting requirements have to be satisfied uh, high so let's look at where TiO2 fits in it. It's very stable. It doesn't have a very good overlap of the absorption cross-section of the solar spectrum because of its large uh, band gap. It has rather poor conversion efficiency because the kinetics of charge transfer at the semiconductor liquid interface is a, is a crucial factor. And it turns out to be pretty poor. Oxide semiconductor surfaces are not very good in terms of fast electron transfer. And it's, uh, TiO2 is very good here. It's compatible with a variety of substrates. Substrates, I mean solutions, really. I'm using the substrate in the enzyme context rather than in the material science context, where substrates are for supports for thin films. Uh, it's low cost. TiO2 is good this, in this regard because it has fairly low cost. Unlike materials such as gallium or indium, indium phosphide, uh, you're talking about a pretty precious metal in, on the Earth's crust, unlike uh, something like t titanium or oxygen, which are plentiful. So the search has gone on. In fact, I'll come back to this point at, right at the end. After three decades, after Fujim and Honda's work, we are no closer to s solving this problem of uh, efficient and cost-effective water splitting. So this is a sobering fact. So you can take something like lithium-ion batteries and, and compare the contrasting fortunes of the two science technologies, if you will. Lithium-ion batteries started around the same time. It's a, almost a very mature technology right now, in spite of uh, a few fires here and there on jets. It's a small matter to be solved. But still, the fact is that it's being used. Uh, it, it, it's been uh, considered for transportation applications. So it's much closer to a commercial real realization than the water splitting uh, approach. So this is going to keep future generations of researchers busy because of the challenges involved in this field. So again, if you're looking for a good problem to solve, uh, even a Nobel Prize, I think this won't be a bad, bad choice of an area if one can find uh, an efficient and a cost-effective approach to water splitting. It's going to be a huge uh, solution to our energy and environmental problems because it has think about it uh, water splitting has absolutely zero carbon footprint so uh, not only are you uh, ge you're generating hydrogen but you're recovering uh, water back when you're either burning hydrogen or using hydrogen in the fuel cells so you're closing the cycle completely whatever has been whatever material has been consumed has been regenerated so it's a completely sustainable solution to the energy problem. Um, and in fact, something which plants <coughs> do, but plants do it at fairly low efficiencies. Of course, nature doesn't design systems with high efficiency because there's natu na natural systems have a lot of redundancy built in. On the other hand, man-made systems don't have that luxury. We have to pay attention to cost. We have to pay attention to efficiency. So we have to be able to do the water splitting or similar chemistry much more efficiently than what plants do in photosynthesis. So that's a challenge we have. So we, we cannot be biomimetic, we need to be bio-inspired. Something like, for example, we have done uh, in, in the design of aircraft. The whole field started by watching birds in flight, but we have, we have now done much better than what nature can do in designing very efficient and long-range aircraft because of the invention of jet engine and so forth. So we have to be able to do a similar thing in here. We have to be, we have to surpass what nature does. 
in, in designing man-made solutions to energy. So again, some more observations. If you look at oxide semiconductors, you can ask the question, what has really contributed to, our, to a huge enhancement in our understanding of the chemistry, the materials, the science of oxide semiconductors? One can argue that high TC superconductors contributed to progress in this field. This happened again, if you recall, around the 70s. So this opened up a, a huge explosion in our in both interest as well as in our understanding of chemistry of oxide semiconductors. And in fact, that's going to contribute to new photocatalysts in, uh, in the energy area as well. Uh, another uh, if, uh, synergy has been uh, uh, the colloid chemistry community. In fact, that has contributed to the science of quantum dots, how we can make uh, quantum dots of very precisely controlled such sizes is, is thanks to the, to the lessons that we learned from the colloid chemistry community. Ultra-fast time resolved spectroscopy has contributed to a huge progress in this field because this enables us to understand the dynamics of electron transfer at electro electrolyte electrode interfaces, semiconductor electrode interfaces, and so on and so forth. Nanotechnology has contributed, again, you can argue that quantum dots is a direct result of the revolution uh, has ha happened in nanotechnology. Electrocatalysis at this point I made, but this is something we need to do more of. Uh, it, we need to have dialogues across communities. So the key here is cross-disciplinary activities. This, this challenge is not going to be solved by people working in one area. Electrical engineers will have to team up with materials physicists, uh, scientists, engineers working together to solve this problem. Okay, lastly, I don't know how we are doing time-wise. We started a little late, right? 15 minutes. So with the time that remains, let me talk uh, just a couple of examples of the sort of things we do in our lab. Again, I won't be able to go into details because of time constraints, but at least I hope to give you a flavor of the type of uh, science and, and engineering that we do. So I want to talk about time and energy efficient synthesis of semiconductors. Now why is this important? When we are talking about use of a material for an energy conversion application, we need to consider how much energy has gone into making that material. This gives us a so-called energy payback time. Because for the economics to work out, energy payback time has to be small. That means whatever energy we are putting into the material, we need to be able to get back very quickly. If you look at silicon, for example, silicon is the prototype semiconductor. It is made by high temperature chemistry. It's made by very use of toxic, nasty chemicals. Uh, a lot of steps involved in the synthesis, all of which contributes to the increased cost of the material to make uh, uh, device quality or semiconductor quality silicon from some, some materials such as sand, silicon dioxide. This is why, for example, organic solar cells have been very popular because you are making these materials at very low temperatures, at mild conditions. So the key is to make this ratio as small as possible. Obviously, you want to make the device very efficient so this denominator can be increased, but you also want to minimize the numerator in terms of the energy which goes into making the material. That's, you can see that is very high for an example such as silicon. Uh, unfortunately, most of the oxide materials have been made by high temperature rules, ceramic rules. So the, this numerator tends to be very high because a lot of, you need to be able to put in energy into the system to heat it to very high temperatures for the reaction to occur. So if we can minimize that, then we we will be shrinking the payback time and improving the economics of the energy conversion process overall. The optimal time is a few months as opposed to a few years. If you can make the energy payback time uh, six months or lower, that means you have recovered the cost of making the material within six months. Why is time important? Because if you want to screen a large number of candidates, you've seen some of the challenges in finding a suitable catalyst for water splitting. So we, this means that we need to be able to screen a large number of candidates 
we need to shrink the time of making the material because if we spend a lot of time for making each candidate material, then it's going to be cost prohibitive. So we can learn here from the pharma industry, they screen a large number of candidates using combinatorial synthesis. So we need to be able to shrink the time as well as the energy required for making the semiconductor. And this is where these two techniques come in. Electrodeposition is a, is a means to make uh, a material, semi, including semiconductors, under relatively mild conditions. Combustion synthesis is a new category of methods that we, we have had a lot of fun with recently, and I'll show you an example of that. As opposed to that, you take something like soil gel chemistry, which chemists use a lot for making things like quantum dots. This takes almost two days to make a, a batch of material, so this is not very time efficient. Certainly, it's very energy efficient because soil gel chemistry is done at very low temperatures, at ambient temperature, close to ambient. Chemical bath deposition is the same way. It takes a lot of time to make films of the material. So let me uh, talk about electrodeposition of semiconductors. Now, electrodeposition of semiconductors is a relatively new field, and we were able, we were fortunate to get in on the ground floor of this technology, like like we did with photoelectrochemistry. Uh, this only started in the 1970s or so, as opposed to metal electroplating, which dates back to 18th century or even earlier. There have been uh, examples of metal, ele metal electroplating even from Egyptian civilization, very old. It's in a very old technology. On the other hand, plating semiconductors is relatively new. And now we have learned how to do it. We can Manipulate the nano, at the nano scale, we can make these semiconductors in a wide variety of morphologies, including nanotube arrays. We can control the diameter of the nano, these holes. We can uh, control the wall thickness. We can even put dyes inside these nanotubes for making dye sensitized solar cells. A lot of these, these, of course, I'm summarizing about six or seven years of work in this one slide. And a lot of these have wound up in uh, journal colors and so forth. You can see we can make things like nano rods or hex hexagonal shaped nano rods and with holes in them. So we, we can tune these morphologies by controlling the chemistry of the electrodeposition environment. We can tune the morphology. And this is very useful because we can thereby control the performance of the device by controlling the dimensions at the nano scale. Here's another example of organic, inorganic hybrid materials. These have applications in energy storage because if you put a conducting polymer such as polyaniline in conjunction with an oxide semiconductor, these can store a large amount of charge. So these have applications as electrochemical capacitors. Uh, so this opens the door to new generations of capacitor devices. Again, we can make these using electro chemical techniques with or without light. In fact, if you shine light on these, you have another me method of initiating polymer growth because these holes, photogenerated holes on these nanotubes can oxidize the monomers, let's say aniline, to polyaniline, and thereby they can initiate growth of the conducting polymer inside the nanotubular region of space. So, these are uh, innovations that our laboratory has been involved in the past few years. CO2 splitting, I mentioned earlier. Here are the possible scenarios. You can, you can do this one electron reduction chemistry leading to a radical anion, but this is energetically not a very good way. You can see the potential required for this. Remember, the more negative the potential, the more difficult it is from an uh, ease of uh, reaction point. Uh, the two electron reduction of CO2 gives rise to carbon monoxide. This is useful if you want to generate something like synthesis gas. For example, syngas is a one is to one mixture of CO and H2. So this is a way to generate a syngas from uh, carbon dioxide as a feedstock. Again, the attractiveness of these approaches is the fact that you are remediating a greenhouse gas such as CO2 at the same time generating useful products. These reactions then give rise to alcohols, for example. This is uh, methanol, 
and this is methane ultimately. So you're converting to energy rich products, you're taking something as inert as CO2 and converting it into a liquid fuel. Uh, what's the significance of this? Look at methanol generation. Methanol generation is done you, uh, by most of the 90% of the market now is dominated by hydro, uh, 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 by form, hydrocarbon, uh, by reforming of hydrocarbons. And this is a uh, very intense process in terms of temperatures and pressures. Uh, on the other hand, photoelectrochemically, we can, if we can do this in much, under much milder conditions, that has a significance from a practical perspective. So again, uh, this is a commodity chemical. It's, all these are made by highly energy intensive processes with high carbon footprint. So again, the goal is to minimize the carbon footprint and also to, to, kept, to be able to do this chemistry under much milder conditions. So milder process alternatives are, are attractive and photoelectrochemical methods certainly fall this uh, category. Here's one example of the work which we recently did using copper oxide. Again, copper oxide is an interesting semiconductor. It's a P-type semiconductor. It's made up of elements which are plentiful in nature, copper and oxygen. It's not like gallium or indium or anything like that. It's non-toxic, unlike cadmium sulfide or cadmium telluride. Copper is relatively non-toxic, at least at low levels. Uh, so what we were able to show was by tuning the, the morphology in the nanoscale, we are able to convert CO2 very efficiently to methanol. We, so we developed a method using a combination of a hybrid method, uh, uh, using a combination of thermal oxidation and electrodeposition to make a, a, a hybrid copper oxide containing copper in both oxidation states two and one. So this is a mixture of cuprous oxide and cupric oxide, and it turns out that both the components are needed for the efficient reduction, photoreduction of methanol. So here again, we are learning a lesson from nature, that nature does it not by a pure one-phase, single-phase material, but nature assembles, self-assembles many different components which have complementary functionalities, and essentially we are trying to copy nature here. Again, this is uh, micrographs of the morphology of these uh, materials. And you can, again, I won't go into the details of the methodology here. What These are our voltammetry traces. So we scan the potential slowly and we measure the photocurrent. So these are under simulated solar irradiation of these copper oxide nanorods, if you will. And the blue curves here are under nitrogen, and these red curves are under CO2. So you can see the drastic differences. In nitrogen, what's happening here is these electrons which are photogenerated are reducing photons to hydrogen. So we are splitting water here. Uh, on the other hand, in the presence of CO2, the photogenerated electrons are reacting or attacking CO2. How do we know that? We s capture aliquots from the reaction chamber and we shoot it to a GCMS. We can prove that methanol is formed. And we can compute the efficiencies of this process in terms of how much charge is passed to how many millimoles of CO2 the methanol that we are, we are measuring. And it turns out that 95% of the electrons are going towards selectively reducing CO2 to methanol. So these, th this process is extremely efficient. And, and we can rationalize this on the basis of this nanoscale morphology and the presence of the copper oxide in two distinct compositions. So this, what this does is it brings about vectorial electron transfer, and the electrons are efficiently funneled toward this redox level of uh, CO2 to methanol. And in fact, this was featured and seen in use uh, not too long back. Uh, this paper has probably come out already and can come. So uh, we have also uh, extended these studies to look at uh, more careful details of the mechanistic aspects of this overall process. But, but I won't have time to go into the details. All I can say is this process has imposed immense potential because we are converting something as uh, uh, a greenhouse gas, such as CO2, to a value-added product, such as methanol. 
So let me close with a final example of the use of combustion synthesis again as an example of time and energy efficient preparation of uh, oxide semiconductors. And again, remember the lower the energy input that is required for making the semiconductor, the shorter, in principle, the energy payback time is. And in fact, in this method, the combustion synthesis, we mix an oxidizer and a fuel, and what happens is the, the, the whole mixture undergoes combustion, and it's a highly exothermic process, so all of the energy required for the synthesis comes from within the system. We don't have to supply external heat to the system. So for a fuel, we use something like urea or thiourea or glycine, and for the oxidizer, we use the metal precursor. So for example, if I want to make titanium dioxide, I, I start with a titanium metal precursor, and I can mix the mixture, and I get titanium dioxide within literally seconds. So you get a, a combustion of this mixture, and you get this material. And more importantly, in terms of the chemistry, what is attractive is that by changing the, chemi the chemistry of the fuel, we can change the doping of the semiconductor. For example, we can make titanium dioxide look this color. Uh, so this has a band gap from these touch plots. TiO2 I mentioned earlier has is a white in color. It's a white pig pigment. has a band gap of about 3.2 electron volt. Remember, we mentioned that TiO2 only absorbs in the ultraviolet, ultraviolet range of the solar spectrum. On the other hand, by using thiourea instead of urea, I can bring down the band gap to about 2.5, 2.6, 2.7 electron volt. That's in the visible. You can see that from the coloration. You can make the titanium dioxide yellow. This has huge implications in the use of this material for photocatalysis because you can, in principle, make the process much more efficient by shrinking the band gap, which is one of the handicaps of TiO2. And, and importantly, we can do this very quickly because this entire material is made within seconds. So I can screen a large number of dopants. In fact, we have done that. We have literally uh, screened tens of 20, 50 doping, doping uh, materials for chromium, you name them. We literally went through the periodic table and looked at the resultant material in terms of their color and photocatalytic activity. So this is reminiscent of a combinatorial type of approach. We can, we can adapt this technique to combinatorial synthesis because we can screen a large number of possible combinations of oxidizers and fuels and make different materials very quickly. Uh, final example of generating syngas. I mentioned syngas is a one is to one mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And you can make this using this semiconductor. This is silver bismuth tungstate. This is made up of uh, <coughs> tungsten oxygen clusters, bismuth oxygen clusters, and silver ions in a solid state lattice. Its conduction and valence bands are optimally placed with respect to redox levels for CO2 conversion. Now, this is a useful type of diagram in terms of asking the question whether a given semiconductor will split water or not, because we can superimpose the redox levels for water splitting, in this case, proton reduction shown by this dashed line, red line, and oxidation of water is shown by this uh, dashed line. The two are separated, as we know, by 1.23 electron volt at room temperature. So for a semi given semiconductor to work, the, the, the two levels have to be bracketed by the conduction and the valence band positions. Otherwise, for example, let's look at this particular case. The electrons here simply will not have sufficient energy to reduce protons. Uh, the holes will have plenty of energy to oxidize water, but you, you will not be able to split water using this semiconductor. On the other hand, in the cases where the two levels are bracketed by the conduction and valence bands, in principle, that material will be able to split water. Whether it does so with efficiency it's, remains to be experimentally verified, but at least this gives us a means of screening possible candidates for water splitting. Similarly, you have to ask the question whether the CO2 conversion levels are optimally placed with respect to the conduction band edge, because the photogenerated electrons have an average energy corresponding to the conduction band edge. So the, 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 the 
the electrons will have to have sufficient energy to be able to reduce CO2. And we saw in the case of copper oxide, we were able to do that because the copper oxide, I did not show that, the copper oxide conduction and valence band positions lie very high up relative to the energy scale. Uh, here's a, an example of making silver bismuth tungstate. Again, we take silver precursor, silver nitrate, uh, bismuth precursor, and, and tungsten precursor, mix it with uh, urea, pyrourea, and again, the mixture ignites, and you, you form this material. We can, we can grind it, work it up, and you can see the couch plot here. Again, this is a way of assessing the band gap by diffuse reflectance measurements. We can compute the energy band gap of this material, and this turns out to be about 2.7 electron volt, which is what that shown here. And this is an example where we have modified the surface of this material with platinum as a catalyst. So now we can use this. Let's see how this material compares with the counterpart made by solid state reaction. Because I can take the same precursors and heat it to very high temperatures in a solid state reaction. In principle, I can get the same product, but it takes much longer. It takes several hours for the solid mixture to react. Why is that? Because the reaction rates are slowed down in the solid state because the transport processes are much slower in the solid state. So it takes overnight heating to get that same material, as opposed to several seconds to get the same material. You look at the morphology, and we have done that using XRD and transmission electron microscopy. The material which is made by combustion synthesis turns out to be much finely divided compared to what is made by the solid state group. Again, I compare that here in terms of the particle dimensions and the surface area. You can also see that in the XRD patterns, that the material made by combustion synthesis is much more finely divided. Why is that? Because these particles are being exposed to very high temperatures instantaneously at very short duration. So they are, they are much finer divided than the solid state reaction. They also tend to be much more photocatalytically active. You can see that here, where I'm comparing the photocatalytic activity of this material made by combustion synthesis with the solid state group. You can see that the material made by combustion synthesis is much more active uh, photocatalytic. These are kinetic plots made from these raw data. These are pseudo first order kinetic. So again, that's, that, that can be rationalized on morphological grounds. Now, I take this material, I expose it to CO2 or dissolved CO2, I can make carbon monoxide and hydrogen. So I'm making syngas uh, at ambient temperatures, unlike what is done in industrial uh, processes right now. Syngas is made at very high temperatures, very high pressures. So this has an economic potential in terms of lowering the the, se the severity of the conditions for synthesis. So we are making syngas at, at, under very mild conditions. What is, amazing to, what is amazing to us was the fact that these platinum did not get poisoned by the carbon monoxide which is generated. This shows that these are generated at different sites. The carbon monoxide is generated away from the platinum sites. So the platinum is not getting poisoned by carbon monoxide. So there is site selectivity in where the reactions are occurring, and this is an area where we need to do much more work to fully understand the mechanistic aspects of these. These are just proof of concept that we can synthesize some gas under these conditions. So let me uh, conclude by, by stating that uh, after 30 odd years, I mentioned this earlier, we don't have a commercial process yet for water splitting nor for CO2 splitting yet. Uh, and, and in fact, this is where the engineering community has to come in. They have to really contribute to reactor designs, improve the process design, if you will, improve the mass transport, improve the kinetics. And that hasn't happened yet. Uh, again, that one possible explanation is that the laboratory efficiencies have not been high enough for the engineers to jump into the fray because the efficiencies have to be at least 10 to 15 percent. Remember, the Sharpie equator limit is 30 odd percent. And but at least we have to be at the 10 to 15 percent uh, efficiency threshold 
for this process to make economic sense. And the efficiencies, they're much lower than that. These are not uh, Faraday efficiencies, they're the overall efficiencies of converting sunlight to a, a final product, as opposed to a Faraday efficiency, which is, I mentioned can be very high, which can be very close to 100%. And so this, uh, we can contrast with the success of the lithium ion batteries or even solid oxide fuel cells. Solid oxide fuel cells are now practically deployed in many uh, instances, including, I believe, in Google as a solid oxide fuel cell for an uninterrupted power source for the entire facility. And that's a, a demonstration of solid oxide fuel cell technology. Uh, PEM fuel cells have not in the light of day because of the cost, high cost associated with that. Uh, I think platinum certainly has been a contributor here. So we have to look for alternatives to platinum. That's an area, another area we are working in. I did not have time to talk about that. But again, the search for metals which are less expensive than platinum would be very important to, to make uh, PEM fuel cells, PEM fuel cells uh, to be routinely deployed in cars and such. So with that, let me thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for the great talk. So, I mean, for Bungie, um, just to appreciate, I was surprised to see the carbon dioxide. I mean, I wasn't surprised I was expecting to see that because that's a big problem. It's a multi-electron process, and all the bioengineers here know that that's one of the sluggish enzymes involved in biology the ones that are involved in carbon dioxide fixation. So, multi-electron, low partial pressure. So this is what you have to deal with. But I have a lot of questions, but you have time to have time to ask. You raise a very good point. One of the handicaps of CO2 is the low solubility of CO2 in water. And we got around that problem, the syngas approach, by using formate instead of CO2, because we use formate as a in situ precursor to CO2 because the holes oxidize formally to generate CO2 in situ. So we get around the solubility issue. There's a way of cheating. Uh, but we wanted to show syngas formation. But you're right. If we want to get around that problem, we have to think of a pressurized reactor to improve the solubility of CO2 in water. That's, that's another problem which I did not mention. Yeah, so any other questions? I mean, any questions at all? I didn't even ask them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in terms of combustion synthesis process, so when uh, you synthesize the powder, I believe titanium, um, since it's going to high, very high um, temperatures, right. very small seeds start to grow in the structure, but uh, they are they, they they tend to agglomerate because of the high energy. Right. So did you have any problem with like? Inputting something like grinding process or bottling yeah, we, process. Yeah, we do work it up by grinding, but you can see the particle size. Agglomeration is always a problem with these powders, uh, but it, it doesn't seem to affect when you disperse it in water and use it as a photocatalyst. That is not an issue. You can see that relative to the solid state material, uh, Relative to the solid state material, you can see that the combustion synthesized material showed higher efficiency. So if, if, if this catalyst agglomeration was a huge problem, that would have reflected in very poor efficiencies for dye oxidation. So here we used a, a dye such as methyl orange, and we simply monitor the color fading of that dye with time. So this was a probe just to probe the photocatalytic activity. But we, we do work it up, we grind it up. After. So you get a foamy mass after the reaction. You can see that here. Uh, and then you, you, you grind it up to, to get from there to the final product. And uh, how, how does it compare to something like sodium? I mean, in terms of particles, in terms of the final energy input, because you have to input something like grinding at the end as the yeah. whole cost in terms of energy. Uh, but time is a huge factor. Soja takes a couple of days to to make the material. Yeah, I mean, in terms of that efficiency that you have shown, have you done any comparison? Oh, uh, th this this is probably very com comparable to uh, to soja derived materials. I see. 
the, the, yeah, oh yeah. Uh, we, we are getting the range of, uh, in fact, we are doing better than Sojo, General Manager. But we have a huge advantage in terms of time. Uh, although I agree, Sojo is also very mild, but it takes, as you know, several hours to make the material. Here we can get the same material in, in seconds, literally. So how, just how does combustion method compare to like a flame pyrolysis or spray pyrolysis? They are all related, even high, I would say hydrothermal, they're all, uh, I would say, they are related families of material, uh, methods, if you will. Uh, spray pyrolysis, uh, in our hands, uh, it's been problematic. You always wind up with uh, clogging of, uh, of the spray, for example, and you got to keep the substrate heated up. <coughs> Uh, so, uh, it's not a very uh, easy method to scale up, I don't believe, spray pyrolysis is not. Um, hydrothermal synthesis, as you know, there's been a lot of interest in that. So, I would say that's a competitor to combustion synthesis. They are, they are related in some way. Essentially, the chemistry is related in that sense. Although, combustion synthesis, we are using the built-in exothermicity of the process to make it energy efficient. Yeah, I like your, your analysis of the dynamics of the correlation of the energy um, Along those lines of terms of like balance, uh, how, how do you get a competitive problem? I mean, say like an electron production process and you can see it. Yeah, it's... Uh, we, we certainly don't understand all of the aspects. The amazing thing to us is we're not using any uh, metal storage catalyst at all. In fact, some of the work which has been done by other people uh, like uh, Andy Bokarsley, for example, has uh, used materials such as gallium arsenide and uh, indium phosphide. Uh, they, they use co-catalysts like pyrenee, for example, to do this reduction. We, we don't have anything here other than CO2 and water and nothing else. Uh, so we are passing, a, we are able, this material is able to store a lot of electrons. And, and I think the, I showed earlier, I think the methanol is a six electron, it's a six electron process. So uh, we certainly need to understand more about how this material is able to store these electrons, and again, I think ultra-fast spectroscopy or the pump probe spectroscopy uh, seems to be badly needed here. We haven't certainly done that yet. So we don't understand all of the kinetics. The, the interesting thing is we don't need any, uh, usually when you have multiple electron transfers, you need something like a platinum or a metal catalyst to store these electrons. And we don't seem to need that at all in this system. But yeah, there's a lot to be understood still. There's also, I did not mention, there's a self-healing in this system because the electrons first reduce copper 2 to copper 1. And so it, it undergoes a, a, a self-healing, if you will, before the electrons are passed from the oxide phase to CO2. So it undergoes a, a chemical change from a plus two state to plus one state by the photon generated electrons before they are shuttled out of the oxide phase. We see that in terms of waves over long term experiments. Again, I did not show. Over several hours we can sustain this, but you see the photocurrents going through these waves. That's because of the modulation of the composition through the cycle when the electrons are shuttled through the oxide. Other questions? As you sort of last, I will ask a couple of questions that are mostly general. It's still self healing. That's another bias by I think that's different. From Absolutely. That. But uh, one of the things is now there's a little bit more fuss about using nitrogen fixation because we can cover both of chemistry to store energy. And the next question is how the price of the natural gas, the low price of the oil, is going to affect the funding for this. 
Competition from the fossil fuel industry. This time, I think we are in better shape because the last time around there was not the environmental concerns. People were not worried about global warming at that time, so it was all tied to the price of oil per barrel or per barrel. So when the price dropped down, all interest in alternative energy research got affected simultaneously. But this time around, I think because of the environmental concerns, I think uh, we're not going to see that. So I, I don't think we're going to see those drastic fluctuations. Yeah, you're right, there's a huge glut of natural gas, but one of the ways would be to convert the natural gas into liquid fuels, yeah, instead of directly using it. And there, there's certainly uh, there's room for that technology right now. That certainly seems to be the case in, in Texas. People. Uh, uh, although it's picking up again, it's like the natural gas industry is picking up again. I think so. Maybe it's going to turn the corner. Okay. So, yeah. The carbon tax could affect the trade off. Uh, the fossil carbon. Yeah. 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 I mean, we 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 have talked about that, and uh, I think Europe Europe was talking about carbon caps and tax and carbon trading. Mm -hmm. Uh, so instead of subsidizing it, actual taxing. Nate Lewis. Nate Lewis. He was talking about four years ago about some of this guy. Yes, I a good friend of mine. How does how does your relate to this? I I do I do very similar stuff to what Nate does. In fact, we both uh, we both got into the field around the same time. He did his graduate studies with Mark Reichen's group in, in MIT around the time when I was post talking So we belong, I had another table in there where I, I categorized researchers in terms of generations. So the, 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 I did not show that because I got some flat from show, showing that in terms of where people fit into boxes. But Nate and I belong to the same generation. We are the second generation of researchers in this area, along with people like Andy Lukarski and Princeton, who's been doing a lot of work at I think it's low-cost, long-term stability, and he can get a Not all three. Not all three. Uh, that's the way he put it. Well, I had, not, I had a much wider list of... Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's not an easy problem, which, which again, explains why we have not come any closer. So, Fushima and Honda started out with TiO2, and still people are working with TiO2 to this day. It's not a good material because uh, if the band gap is so high. So uh, it's, it's kind of somewhat sobering. Uh, I think, again, a contributing factor there was uh, a loss of funding in the area. It drove a lot of researchers away from this area. Uh, people like Nate and Bruce Fox and myself, we stuck it around. We stuck around and we, we developed, we started to do other things with semiconductors like environmental Time when the funding dried up for energy conversion, we used uh, we used funds to develop tech techniques for making semiconductors and for using them in environmental remediation applications. But it, it caused huge uh, change in the, in the momentum because all of the momentum which was built up suddenly was lost. It literally drove many researchers away from the field because of lack of funding. This is the Reagan time, the Star Wars time. Very bleak. And not and I, I call it the uh, spunk period there. Slide. So I guess 
stage. If you have any other questions, you can ask them directly in the personal conversation. Let's take right again for the next one.